This program is brought to you by SoundsTrue.com. At SoundsTrue.com, you can find hundreds of downloadable audio learning programs, plus books, music, videos, and online courses and events. At SoundsTrue.com, we think of ourselves as a trusted partner on the spiritual journey, offering diverse, in-depth, and life-changing wisdom. SoundsTrue.com. Many voices, one journey. You're listening to Insights at the Edge. Today, my guest is Mary O'Malley. Mary is an author, counselor, and acknowledged leader in the field of spiritual awakening. Through her writing and teachings, she empowers people to replace fear, hopelessness, and struggle with ease, well-being, and joy. Which sounds true, Mary has published a new book entitled, What's in the Way is the Way a practical guide for waking up to life. In this episode of Insights at the Edge, Mary and I spoke about the eight spells that keep us feeling separate from life. We talked about life as an intelligent process that we can trust and the importance of being curious and how curiosity is the opposite of fixing. We also talked about the three skills of awakening and how Mary has an armchair on the moon in which she looks at the earth and from which she understands the awakening process. Here's my very helpful and illuminating conversation with Mary O'Malley. Mary, in your new book, there are so many things actually from your new book I want to talk about, but I want to begin with this one idea that really struck me because I'd never heard it before presented this way. You write about how there are eight spells that oh, keep us feeling yeah. separate. And I thought, what do you mean spells, eight spells? Yeah. Well, I love the word spells because a spell is something that's laid over the top of us. It's not true. And it can be lifted. And this word came just as I was writing. And you know, when we really uh, look into the eyes of a babe, you know, there's the whole universe. And there are no thoughts in that child's mind. And slowly and surely we absorb from the people around us. Just like we absorb language, if you listen you live in Japan, you absorb Japanese, or you know, if you live in America, you absorb English. We absorb the stories that the people around us are living in, and we begin to create what Eckhart Tolle calls the mind-made me. I think that's just brilliant, because the, me, the mind makes me here you are and then here is a storyteller in your head that has a world all of its own and most people crawl into that world and think it is them but when you begin to wake up to life to really be here for life and you begin to see there's a difference between being here for this great majestic, mysterious unfolding called life right here in this living moment, and then your story about it. And most people live in their stories. So to get to know the storyteller, it's very helpful to see what it's made out of. And I've had the good grace to be with people, work with people over 30 years. and I've seen into the minds and hearts of thousands and thousands of people. And these eight core spells are the foundation of this separate, conditioned self that we have all crawled into that keeps us disconnected from life. Well, I want to go ahead and talk about the first two spells that you call foundational right. spells. And, and I want to go into this because I think it's just, as I said, so interesting. So the first one that you write about is 
I am separate from life. And then the second one is life is not safe. And I think especially that idea that life is not safe is something yeah. that many people have that experience. You know, yeah. you, you say life yeah. is always for you as a person, but I right. think a lot of people don't feel that life's for them. They feel that, You're you know, right. life's against right. me. I, my, I went outside and yeah. my car got towed. How can you say life's for me? Right. You know? Right. So when we were in the womb, we were at one with life and then we were born and then now we were a separate being and and it takes a while to begin to take hold this idea takes hold inside of us that i am here and you are out there and that's what i mean by you know, I am a separate be this me inside of us that is always talking about life. And that is really, truly our suffering, this idea that there is a me and then there is an out there. And when we be separate out of life in that way, Remember, we were raised by giants, you know, for a long time. They were giants to us, and, and they were mostly unconscious giants. And we needed them. We were, we were in a deep, deep need of connection with them. Even more than we needed food or shelter, we needed connection, and yet our parents were gone. And so the people around us, they began to wound us in ways that even if they loved us, they wounded us. And so life began to be something to guard against. You know, the two core wounds we get is invasion and abandonment. And invasion can go as simple as a uh, mother that is telling you what to do, when to do, how to do, and uh, all the way to sexual abuse and and violence and abandonment can go all the way from a parent that is too busy to uh, be with you to uh, a parent that actually leaves. There was a study done once of children and their breathing patterns. And all of them, before they went to preschool, were breathing this natural breath that dogs and cats breathe, you know, where their whole trunk was engaged, and not one of them was breathing their natural breath by the time they went to first grade. So as we're taking on this mind-made me and trying to maneuver through this very confusing environment when we are growing up, we learn to hold on, we learn how to tighten, we learn how to guard, and then we slip into this idea that our job is to manage life. Our job is to manage ourselves, to make us good enough or right enough. Of course, we secretly believe we're never quite good enough or right enough. And our job is to manage the environment outside of us. And this cuts us off from an alive, nourishing uh, connection with this great creative flow called life. Now, Mary, I can imagine somebody who's listening says, you know, Mary keeps taking me back to the womb, to the eyes of a baby. Isn't this a little regressive in a way? I mean, I don't want to go back there. I'm an adult. I now have all this freedom and power. I mean, I don't really want to go backwards. Right. And it's not that we're going backwards. It's that everything that we took on, remember that we're free-flowing aliveness. That's our natural state. All you have to do is look at nature and you see that it's free-flowing aliveness. And that when we were very young, we were connected to that great river of free-flowing aliveness. Then we began to hold on and run away into our heads into a conversation about life. And that's what I call the storyteller in this book. And so it is those template, those core experiences that we had that cause us to tighten, to contract, to maneuver through life in you know, a way that tries to manage life enough so that we feel calm inside. And so we don't need to go back. 
We need to understand where it's come from. What is this holding in my neck? Why do I keep on getting that uh, tight knot uh, you, you know, in my stomach? Why do I always just cry and cry at movies but can't cry you know, when I'm with my mate or, or my friend? So we're not going back. We're just beginning to learn the power of our focused attention. It's one of the most powerful healers that human beings have, that when your attention and your immediate experience come together, that is when the energy that we have learned how to and then put it underneath our everyday awareness, we have learned how to hold on to life. We have learned how to resist life. And when your attention and your immediate experience come together, that is when this holding begins to let go on its own. Mm -hmm. You talk about something in the book, what's in the way is the way. Right. You talk about learning the art of the U-turn. Is that what right. you're talking about here? Is this the U-turn? Yeah. yeah, yeah. in a way, yes, that here we are and mostly our attention is out in life. And believe you me, when I first started meditating, you know, years and years and years ago, you know, somebody asked me just to close my eyes and notice my breath. It was too scary for me. It was too intimate. I had been so used to being out here and trying to manage everything and then feeling like I was such a failure at doing all of that. But slowly and surely, I began to be able to do this U-turn. I began to be able to do the Y-O U-turn. And we begin to understand, and this is a real core premise in this book, we begin to understand that life is an intelligent process. And we actually trust it a lot. I mean, when was the last time you digested your food or made your hair grow or made a day come out of night? This is a highly intelligent process. At one time, you were one cell that was so tiny you couldn't even be seen with a naked eye. And it developed into 70 trillion cells, and they all know how to work without a thought from you. But we don't recognize how much we trust life. And we definitely think that we've got to get to the good stuff in life and get rid of the bad stuff. And this is our addiction to struggle. But when you begin to realize that this came all in one fell swoop as I was writing the book, life is set up to bring up what has been bound up, so it can open up to be freed up, so you can show up for life. You begin to become fascinated during the challenges of your life. Rather than being mad at your mate because they said they would call at six and they don't call at seven, you begin to become interested in what does this bring up inside of you and that is how we set free all of this bound up energy that its natural state is free-flowing aliveness now this is a very important idea i want to go into more life is destined to bring up for you what is bound right. up so let's say i do i parked my car someplace and i walk out and i you know i didn't see the sign and my car has been towed Right. And I feel a sense of, you know, frustration, yeah. agitation, mm -hmm. anger, etc. And I'm mad. I'm upset. You know, right. and life was destined to bring up how upset I am. No, I'm upset for a, a darn good reason. My car got to. Right. Yeah. And absolutely at that level, it is you know, a darn good reason. But what we do is that we are always at some level a victim to life. It's happening to us. And the, the mind-made me is always trying to jockey to make sure that everything is okay. And we miss this whole thing that life is an intelligent process and it is putting us in the exact situations that we need to begin to see how this conditioned self operates inside of us. 
And that's when life begins to become an adventure. That, you know, still, I have a very, very close family member that whose cancer returned uh, a year ago, and it's been a very intense year. And, you know, I have lived in a lot of spaciousness for a lot of years, and this is stirred up. You know, the, like kind of like the dregs of the of the holding that I took on. You know, when I was young, and it's been so powerful. I call it becoming a tightness detective. It's been so powerful to be alert to when the body starts tightening, or the mind starts tightening, you know, or the emotions start tightening, and then get curious about that. And when you can bring your attention to this conditioned self that keeps us separate from life, that is when it begins to lift just like the uh, morning fog lifts with the light of the sun. So I love to say, Tammy, you don't have to like it, but you can trust it. And I've walked through this with, you know, thousands of people over the years, and it's just amazing what happens to them when they are in a situation that they feel life is happening to them, that then they switch it and they realize life is showing them something about this conditioned self so that they can see it and see through it more so that they can come back and be available to life. Okay, I'm going to give you a specific example, Mary, because I became familiar in reading what's in the way is the way, this idea of becoming a tightness detective. And I thought, this is great. I love this. I love this. This makes a lot of sense to me. So here today, I am driving in my car, and I have a new adorable but mischievous puppy who (laughs) can't stand her car seat. She's not used to it. So we're in the car and she's yelping the entire time. And Uh I'm watching myself. You wouldn't have to be a very good detective to be able to see that I was getting tighter and tighter as she continued to be inconsolable. And so here I am. I'm tight. I'm tight. I can't stand hearing her cry, but I don't know what to do. It's not safe to let her out of this dog carrier that she can't stand. Okay. I'm curious about how I'm feeling. It's pretty clear to me. I'm annoyed and I'm upset. Where's the insight here? I'm a tightness detective. What's next? So there's a couple of levels of it. I mean, you're noticing, you know, that's important. You know, most people just get caught in the situation and they yell at the dog or they pull over the side of the road and cry, but you're noticing. And that may not be the time to actually take that noticing inside and to begin to really bring your attention to exactly what is holding on inside of you. And it would be something about helplessness. You know, we all knew such great helplessness when we were young at times. And that caused us to, I mean, it was just so painful. You know, I've been working with a woman who uh, was uh, had difficulty with her spine, and when she was 18 months old, They put her in a cast from her neck down to, I think, her knees. And she was in the hospital for weeks, and she would cry, and her parents would come, and she would cry more when they left, so then her parents did not come and visit her. The nurses decided they couldn't come and visit her. So let's fast forward years later that she is somebody that has a compulsion that is just has overtaken her life. And it brings up so much self-hate and so much uh, uh, despair and hopelessness. It brings up the exact energy that was bound up in that experience when she was young. And she is learning now to be with herself when these feelings come rather than running away. Now, with your situation in the car, it's not time. You're driving. You're you know, probably going to an appointment. It's not time. But just that acknowledgement 
and then the asking life for clarity. And maybe when you're in bed that night, you know, maybe a little bit of that vestige of that holding, and you begin to become curious. We're not becoming curious to figure anything out. That's the the real important piece here. That's the mind trying to figure something out. We're becoming curious. We're bringing our attention and our immediate experience together to begin to allow energy that is bound up to move. Mm -hmm. And that's where the healing is. Mm -hmm. I I took a note from your chapter on the healing power of curiosity, how curiosity is the opposite of fixing. I thought that was so important. And the more you get curious, the more fascinating it becomes. And the more you know, I mean, you know, here I was somebody that fell ever deeper into darkness. I had the kind of childhood you wouldn't wish on anybody. And by the time I was in my early 20s, I was trying to drink it away and eat it away. I gained 97 pounds in a year once. You know, I was trying to drug it away, and when that didn't work, I went into a mental hospital for the better part of a year, and when that didn't work, I tried to kill myself three times. Oh, my. And then a man called Joe Kramer came into my life, and he was one of the the people that first brought yoga here to the United States and he would come up from California and my mother I mean this is this is life I mean it's such an amazing adventure you know and my mother was going to go for a weekend with him and and she said I can't go and you know would you like to go I'm 27 and oh well yeah maybe okay you know and I walk into that room Tammy and he starts talking and my life changed from a B-grade, black and white, grainy horror movie to a Dolby surround sound, Technicolor, Panavision movie. And when I walked out of that room, I could not tell you what he said, but I knew that it was truth. And so he came up a couple of more times, and the third time he came up, I uh, took a tape deck in there and recorded the whole weekend and then went home and transcribed the whole weekend and I had this book this book of the every single word that he said over that weekend and when my house and store burnt to the ground I lost everything it was the book that I grieved so he came up one last time and I said to him I want you I want to tell you what I have gotten from listening to you and I want you to tell me if I am on the right track. And he said, yeah. And I said, there's two parts of it. And the first was, in the seeing is the movement. And oh my God, his eyes just twinkled. And he said, yes. And what he meant, Tammy, is that there's nothing that needs to be fixed, changed, rearranged. There is nothing wrong with us. I had tried, I mean, I went to doctors and psychologists and psychiatrists and group therapists and hypnotherapists and everybody tried to fix me. And when he came into my life, I began to see and he confirmed for me that it is when we can bring our attention and be with something that it begins to move. We don't need to fix it as long as we try to fix it. And my God, we use meditation to fix it. What I'm inviting people into is using meditation to hone your attention so that you can then bring it here for the living process. So then I said, okay, so the whole sentence should be, in the seeing is the movement until the observer and the observed become one. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, go find out. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I want to ask you just one question about that, this word seeing, in the seeing. Tell me what you mean by seeing, because it doesn't seem like you're talking about something visual per se. You're talking about something deeper than that. 
Yeah, oh it's it's yeah, it's about attention. So let's say that uh you're in the car and the dog, you know, is sure. yipping and you know and all yeah. that and you know, you're you're acknowledging, you know, what's going on. But then let's say that you take him to the vet and the vet takes him back for his checkup and you're in the waiting room. And all of a sudden, oh, that's right. You know, I can see that there's kind of a knot in my stomach. And it, it's really uh, very helpful to begin this with the body, but then we learn how to bring it to the stories in our head and to our emotions. But you bring your attention. Let's say it's just this clench. It could be an ache in your neck. It could be a stabbing in your back. It could be a lump in your throat, an elephant on your chest. And you just close your eyes because you're just waiting there, and you bring your attention into your actual living experience. Now, you've seen it, you know, because you, you, you're recognizing there's kind of a knot in your stomach, but you haven't really been with it. Your attention has not been there for the living experience of it. And that's what Joel taught me, was that when your attention and your immediate experience come together that's seeing the actual being with the actual living experience of whatever is going on inside of you and the more you do that with your body the more that then you can do that with the stories in your head and you can be with even feelings you know in in watching this close family member of of just fighting, fighting for their life, you know, it's just, you know, and, and going through the the most intense chemo you could imagine and major, major surgeries and all that. And when I would be sitting in the hospital, you know, with him, um, you know, and it'd be quiet and his breath was labored and, you know, and, and uh, you know, and he had just come out of surgery and he was moaning and, and I'm sitting there and I'm I'm grounding in this moment, and then up comes a wave of despair, just ancient, deep despair. And instead of identifying with it and starting to ride the wave of despair or the wave of fear, I had you know a lot of fear rose in this last year, I bring my attention to it. And now... That despair is not alone. Now that despair is has a witness to it. And it's just like what happens, you know, if you had a bad day and you go to a, your friend and your friend does with you what you do with you when there is discomfort arising inside of you, whether it's, uh, upset mind or strong emotions or some holding in your body and that friend just says oh my god not again you know and judges you or or tries to fix you or ignores you that that doesn't feel good but when that friend let's say this is a fairly aware friend when that friend just gives you the light of their attention they are just there they're not even saying anything you may talk for 15 minutes and you feel better. Why? Because energy moved through the light of attention. That's what I mean about seeing. You're listening to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. We welcome you to learn more about our collection of more than a thousand learning programs and receive three free gifts just for visiting us. Go to soundstrue.com backslash free. That's soundstrue.com backslash free. And now back to Insights at the Edge. Now, Mary, you talk about 
eight spells where we started our right. conversation. And believe it or not, we only started by talking about the first two. The first but, two. But, but they're what you call the foundational spells. Right. And then right. you move into this section about operational spells. Right. And these are I must control life, a yeah. spell that yeah. I think, yes, I must do it right. And I'm not doing it right enough. So talk to right. me a little bit about how we fall under these operational spells, but more importantly, how we can break those spells. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's so important. You know, I've led groups for years. It's so, and done, you know, retreats in beautiful places. And it's so important. It, 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 well, it's helpful to hang out with other people that are beginning to come back to life, to open to life again and and be present for this amazing, you know, intelligent, creative flow called life. And it really, really helps to have uh, a group of people where they are real about what going is going on inside of them. In fact, uh, a number of years after I met Joel, I had the very wonderful grace to uh, meet Stephen Levine and spent many times with him when he would come up to Seattle and uh, and then got a chance to be with him for 10 days at Brighton Bush once. And he said once, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create a hat. And when you put it on your head, it instantaneously broadcast over a loudspeaker all of your thoughts. And all the people in the room groaned. And he said, but no you would know so much more freedom because you would see we're all doing the same thing. So the, these, this spell, you know, that, that I must control life, which really is the spell I must do life, and then I must do it right, and then I am not doing it right enough. If most people could stop for a moment and just really listen to what's going on in their head, they could see that that is the real uh, foundation of the movement of what is going on in their head. And it's all, you know, comes to this very secret feeling that we all carry that I'm not enough. And so when we get to that place, oh my God, I'm not doing it right enough, then we pick back up again and we say, no, no, I got to control life. I got to be on top of it. If I am top of it, I do my you know, meditations right. And if I think positive thoughts and, you know, and if I give enough money and so on and so forth, then everything will be okay. But we don't look. We don't take time to begin to understand that we're being run by these three operational spells which then lead us to what I call the three hidden spells, the hidden spells that we all have. And those are, I have them here in front of me, I'm wrong, I'm unlovable, and I'm all alone. So I'm sure a listener at this point's like, yeah, I know that. I know that yeah. part of me that feels like I'm not enough, that I'm yeah. wrong, unlovable, yeah. and even alone. Uh, so. Yeah. My question to you, Mary, is here we're shining a light on mm -hmm. these thoughts that are going on in our head underneath the loud speaker. We worked with Stephen Levine's hat. And yes, underneath, you know, yeah. I wish I was doing a better job with this interview. I wish that whatever, whatever's going on inside people, you know, everybody has their own broadcasting voice of what they right. wish was better. What is your now set of instructions when we become aware of this? Well, it is, uh, in the book, there are 10 remembering sessions. They're at the end of each of the 10 chapters. And consciousness, well, let's say this first. Unconsciousness is all, or this storyteller, that's a better word to use, this storyteller that goes on in her head all day long. If you had a little door on your forehead and you open it up, and of the 65,000 thoughts we have a day, you would see these spells operating, and you would see they're all based on fear and glued together with judgment. And it is always, it's fixing, it's trying to 
do things right. It's trying to get rid of what it doesn't like and get towards what it does like. And it's this endless game of struggle. Now, the path to freedom has three core skills that we can learn that we talk about in the remembering sessions. The first is curiosity. For most of us right now, our attention is like a muscle and it's very flaccid. It just follows thought wherever it goes. If the storyteller says, I'm sad, we think we're sad. It says we're mad, we think we're mad. And so we want to begin to strengthen the muscle of our curiosity. And that's why it's so good to set aside some time every day. You know, uh, to me, consistency is far more important than quantity. You know, we start having our times of silence and we go, I'm going to do 20 minutes twice a day, and, you know, and we do it for three weeks and then, you know, it fades. But if we give ourselves, if we begin with just five minutes to notice a focus and to then know that the attention is going to wander off into thought. Of course it is. It's only been there most of our lives. But when you notice you're gone, you don't judge it. And then you bring your attention back. For 10 years, for the 10 years before, between when I uh, was introduced to Joel and then met Stephen, I was a part-time meditator because I couldn't do it right. And just felt the spell I was doing it wrong, and thus I am wrong, and everybody else was doing it right. And then when I met Stephen, he began to show me how to look with great compassion. And that's what when I began sitting every day and, and have for, for many, many years. But every time you bring your attention back, and Stephen said to me, he said, Mary, if you sit for an hour and you bring your attention back to your focus one time in an hour, that is time well spent. And so I began to really see that this wasn't a contest. I wasn't trying to get someplace. I was just discovering how to bring my attention out of the storyteller and bring it back to life. The more that you strengthen that muscle of attention, the easier it becomes that when something comes, when you have a huge reaction, or even a small reaction in life, you don't like the length of the stoplight, your attention is there, your attention is able to see what the mind is doing, and that cloud passes right through you. That's the first skill set of awakening so when we learn how to actually have our attention and our immediate experience together, you know, not an idea about it, but the living experience, and most people don't have a clue about what that means, and that's partly why I wrote the book, was so we can begin to see the phenomenal power of having our attention and our immediate experience together. Something pretty amazing begins to happen. Our heart begins to open. You know, all those years I was with Stephen and all those years I sat with Jack Cornfield and I did, you know, I think thousands of, you know, loving kindness meditations and forgiveness meditations and I didn't feel a lot of a shift. I, I think that I was planting seeds. I think they were very important. But I began to see that when you begin to learn how to be present for your experience and you begin to see this storyteller in your head, you begin to see how young it is, how hard it's been trying your whole life. And that's when you begin to discover the phenomenal power of the second skill, which is I call compassion, but sometimes I call it spaciousness. It's the ability to say, I see you, and that you actually be with that despair or that anger or that fear or that ache in your back, uh, or that uh, uh, mind that just wants to explode, that you are that capacity to see what is going on inside of you. And as you begin to discover how to open around it, how to give it space, 
these parts so respond to our hearts. They're just like you and I. And when we're heard and listened to and honored, we begin to let go. And so do these very ancient parts that we learned how to hold on to when we were very young. And it is just uh, so delightful. I was somebody that uh, uh, really, really lived uh, extreme self-hate. Uh, you know, I've carved on my body with razor blades, and you know, this is my early 20s, and I broke my own arm once because I was drunk. Oh, and I wow. you know, hit the end of a bed. You know, I was trying to hit the bed, and it was a, had a duvet cover over the four-poster bed, and I just kept on hitting it. How do you heal? That kind of deep, deep self-revulsion, it's, it's beyond self-hatred, it's self-revulsion. And it's by learning how to see it, to be with it, and slowly have your heart open to it. Does the judger still come at times? Yes. But I say, oh, hi, you know, you having a bad day? <laughs> you know? and it just gets heard, and it passes right through me. And so this, to me, is where really true lasting healing happens it's it's uh you know they've done this these studies now and i was interviewed for a book uh, like four or five years ago called m braining the m is for the word multiple and they took 600 of the leading edge research papers on our three brains the abdominal brain the heart brain and our head brain and all the studies have shown that the heart brain is our main brain and yet for most of us it had to be shut down it, it, it's too uh, uh, sensitive and when we're young it had to shut down and so we become an object in our minds rather than the subject of our hearts so there is a huge thread through the book that is how to really begin to be with yourself uh, through kindness and care and compassion. And that's how I came out of uh, being a highly compulsive person to one is, who is very normal around food. So then the third skill, and this is, it's so helpful. I call it living in questions. And what I want to say about it is that you know, when the hero goes out and, you know, he's trying to get to the Holy Grail and or the magic wand and, you know, he's just meeting all of these heartaches and hardships like we all do in our lives. And he comes across the White Witch of the North and she gives him a talisman and, and she says, just wear it around your neck and whenever you need help, just rub this talisman. Well, we have this most amazing talisman that's always with us, and we're only beginning to discover the power of living in questions without looking for an answer. It's so important to get that when you really start waking back up into life, your mind thinks you are the one that is awakening. And, you know, it takes a while for that, to see that enough that that begins to relax. And then you begin to realize there is an intelligence with you always. And when you ask a question, the answer will be lived through you. And it really helps you to see that you are not alone in this process. And so when you put those three really basic skills together, you begin to be able to see and see through the clouds of conditioning and come back to our real home, this living moment that is this constantly unfolding adventure <laughs> of the great mystery of life. Mary, you have such a simple, grounded, practical, helpful way of mm. talking about really the, some of the greatest mysteries of life. Mm. And you know, I don't, I don't exactly know how old you are, and it's not important. But you're, you're an older woman. You're a counselor and a spiritual teacher. But some part of me feels that you're, you're sort of one of these hidden, wise mystics that's <laughs> now kind of coming out. But in a way, just so ordinary. In a way, too. I mean, counseling, yeah. teaching, 
working yep. one-on-one and with small groups. And yet here you've yep. written a book that is just so right on the mark, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. And, and the gift I was given was to be given so much heartache that I couldn't get rid of it. I couldn't even kill myself. You know, I was a failure at suicide. And then life began to say, pay attention. And the exciting thing is that mostly people have woken up out of this dream of separation, this conditioned self back into life. You know, they've had to remove themselves from life. Uh, You know, a monastery, a cave, whatever. And thank God for those people because they have been our way showers. But now more and more of us are waking up right smack dab in the middle of rush hour traffic and raising kids and, you know, illnesses and financial difficulties. And that's why I love this title. I, I like to joke. I say, you don't even need to read the book. Just live the title. What's in the way is the way that the great challenges of your life are embedded with gifts. We don't need to get out of life. We need to get into it and gather the gifts that are always embedded in every great challenge of our lives. Now, Mary, before I met you, I hosted a series called Waking Up, What Does It Really Mean? And I interviewed 30 some odd people about spiritual awakening and what spiritual awakening means to them. And so I want to now envelop you, if you will, into that question and that inquiry. Because one of the things I discovered was that people use this term, waking up, spiritual awakening, but they mean different things by it. I want to be really clear what you mean by spiritual awakening. Yeah. To have your mind, your body, and your heart all in the same place at the same time. Hmm. To be here for life. To actually experience not an idea about it, but the living mystery of it. And I have an armchair on the moon, and well, I have a lot of armchairs on the moon. I invite people constantly to come up, you know. And it is it is so amazing to have that kind of broader perspective, and you look over at this blue green jewel of our planet, and. Your heart just opens to it, and and you see over to Mars, and it's, you know, brown and dust, beautiful in its own right, you know, and you look at the moon, it's kind of brown and dusty, you know, and then you look at the Earth, and here are the blues of the ocean, and the whites and the grays of the cloud, and, and here are all the different variations of, of colors of flowers, and my God, there's aardvarks, and zebras, and giraffes, and there's baby spinner dolphins, and there's tiny mountain wildflowers, and there's majestic icebergs. Oh my God, I think it was Robin Williams said, boy, we did not move into the fixer-upper. We got the prime real estate. And if you look at this earth and you will see all of its exquisite creativity, but you'll see that there's 7 billion people wandering around on this planet that has clouds around their head. You know, Alan Watts, the wonderful Zen philosopher, once said, no matter how many times you say the word water, it will never be wet. People have clouds because they have forgotten how to really connect with life, to be open, to actually experience life, to become a part of this great flow of life. And when I sit up there, I see that there's more and more people that with their own attention are clearing their clouds and then they are there present for other people, and then those people turn, and they are present for other people. And I see this movement all around the earth, that humanity is waking up out of the dream of separation, out of the dream of fear. Where this will take us, I don't know. But I see that movement everywhere in my life. And we begin to understand we can make a difference. We really, truly can by healing the war inside of us. We can become a part 
of the healing of our world. So that's what resonates with me when I uh, hear waking up. Now, you mentioned this very interesting idea, which no one else of the 30-some-odd people mentioned, about the belly, the heart, and the mind, all three centers being in the same place. So what I'm imagining is, you know, my head says one thing and my heart says another. And so what do I do in those situations? I'm not all in the same place. In fact, there's a lot of different things going on inside me. Yeah. Yeah. And we uh, we have really made a god of this conditioned self. And it says, you know, in one moment, it says, I want an ice cream cone. And you go get an ice cream cone, and you're, you know, eating the ice cream cone. It says, you shouldn't have done that. And that's what we use to guide our life. But underneath all of that, that holding that is taken over our uh, belly, uh, brain, you know, all of that contraction and and judgment that is taken over our heart brain and all of that busyness and trying that is taken over this head brain which i'm not putting it down at all it's an exquisite tool it only took 13.8 billion years to figure out how to make it you know but it's a wonderful tool for maneuvering through reality it's not reality but underneath all of that is our essence and our essence, you begin to, it's, it's uh, almost like you begin to uh, dance with life. Or maybe a better way to say it is you, you begin to follow the currents of life. And you begin to feel your way through life. And you begin to trust this deep knowing inside of you. Now, Are we always there when we're first starting to awaken? No. And it can be very confusing at times. You have all these conflicting parts. But that's where we come back to the first skill. Be curious. What's here? And we couple it to the last skill. Even if you don't see, you don't have to see something. You just have to notice, and then you can ask life, show me what you're showing me here. You know, you're in the car and the dog is yapping and you're just finding yourself being tight and there's no way that you can go exploring. But you say, okay, life, I notice that you are showing me something here. And you're signaling life at the right time in the right way. Life will show you. And you begin to trust life again. You begin to trust this place that is underneath all of this busyness and holding that we have lived our whole lives. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to circle back just for a moment for a a very powerful statement you made. You were talking about the eight spells, which is where we started our conversation. And you said that they're created out of fear and held together by judgment. And so I thought this was an important thing to pull out and talk about. What do you mean they're created out of fear? Well, go back to, you know, we really were little tiny people in a land of unconscious giants. And they pretty well say that this conditioned self, all of its foundations are pretty well formed by the time we're six years old. You know, you can remodel them, you know, a bit over the years, but the core foundations of it, you know, these core Uh, Beliefs, that's another word you could use for spells. You know, these core beliefs are, we kind of absorb them, you know, inside of us uh, in those first six years of our life. And most of us had unconscious parents. And, and, you know, they may have loved us, but life was a wounding process. And here we are, this little tiny person. Now we're a separate person. Because here I am and life is there, out there. And I've got to do something to make a connection here or I'm going to die. And then the mind starts off on its merry chase. So the foundations of this conditioned mind happened within the framework of fear. And if you watch it very carefully and watch it with kindness, you'll see that most of the time it's scared. It's not 
big fears. It's the fear that the stoplight won't be long enough to put your makeup on or the stoplight will be too long and you may be two minutes late to work. There is this kind of grinding that goes on inside of us all day long. And if you watch it carefully, you'll see that it's foundations. It's all about fear. But you'll see that it tries to manage all of that through judgment. It's constantly judging and looking about how we're doing. Are we doing good enough? Are we right enough? You know, and so on and so forth. And then we judge other people. And then we judge that we judge other people, not understanding that our judgment of people is just like the safety release valve for all of this judgment that we took on when we were young. Mm -hmm. That's the heartache. Oh, that's the heartache. You know, a really, truly whole person has every single part of them woven into their heart. We're all nutty as fruitcakes. That's <laughs> Stephen's hat. You know, and it's so wonderful to discover that everybody else thinks that way too. But we don't have to be at the beck and call of this storyteller in our heads. And that's what life has had me offer to the world. Mary, you've written such a beautiful, helpful practical, grounded book. In my view, it's like gritty spirituality mm. for everyone. Mm. It's it's right there. Mm. And <laughs> it's called What's in the Way is the Way, a Practical Guide to Waking Up to Life. And I wonder if to end our conversation, you teach so many different meditation practices that people can do as part of these quote-unquote rememberings that you offer. I wonder if you could leave us just with one breathing practice here that we yeah. could do as a way to conclude our conversation. Yes. So we learn how to hold our breath and tighten our body and run away to our mind so we become human doings rather than human beings. And our breath can be the most exquisite biofeedback mechanism and also, it can calm what is agitated, it can open what has been closed, and it can ground what has flown off into the ethers. And so one of the most powerful breath practices, and it's so simple, and I just love this, is that as you breathe out, you say the sound, ah. This is the sound, the vibration of the heart chakra. And that it is a uh, no accident that it is in most of the words that we use to point to God. God, Allah, Jehovah, Yahweh. And when you breathe out and say the word ah, you begin to lengthen your out breath. And to order to begin to be able to bring more open breathing, which, oh my God, it's so exhilarating. It is not in, I'm going to take in this deep in-breath, which really causes more stress and you're only using the top part of your lungs. This long, slow, ah, begins to relax what has been holding. It calms. It reminds us everything is okay right now. And if we're in a place we can't say it out loud, we say it silently inside of ourselves. <laughs> ah. Ah. It's a beautiful note to end on. Mary O'Malley, the author of the new book, What's in the Way is the Way, a practical guide to waking up to life. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much for your life of wisdom. Thank you. My joy. SoundsTrue.com, many voices, one journey. <laughs>